Good morning, Christ Community Church. Um, if the Lord has saved you, please stand up. <laughs> so we're going to get started with this first song. Uh, dear God, thank you for another day that wasn't promised to us, Lord Jesus. Let this just be a blessing to you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life, but I wanna be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy is wide, cause you're good and you promise. I'll take you at your word. I'll take you at your word. You said it, I believe in. I've seen how good it works. You started, you're completing. I'll take you at your word. this morning? How many of you are thankful that even though the world may lie to you, someone's going to promise and cross their fingers and hope to die, poke a hundred needles in their eyes, they're going to disappoint you. But God's word is sure and steadfast. His promises to us are yes and amen. 
Amen. Let me read to you this text out of Hebrews this morning that the Lord put upon my heart. Uh, we're coming in the, out of this season, really, of where we're, uh, we're anticipating the arrival of Jesus, and we celebrate the cross and the resurrection. We celebrate the empty tomb. We celebrate the fact that Jesus came when he said he would, fulfilling prophecy, right? But I want you to hear this this morning. God's story isn't finished yet, right? This is what it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 20. It says, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time. Do you hear that? Listen to me. He's going to come back. He's going to appear a second time. But listen to this. He's going to come a second time not to deal with sin. He dealt with sin upon the cross. He claimed victory. He cried to Telestai on the cross. But he's going to come a second time not to deal with sin. But listen to this. To save, to rescue, to sweep off of their feet those who eagerly are waiting for his return. Yes? Can I get an amen for that this morning? Because here's the fact of the matter, just as sure as Jesus came the first time to deal with sin, just as the word said he would, he will come the second time to rescue you from this body of flesh, to deliver you to the kingdom of God, just like this word says he will. Right? Yes. My concern is this, church. My concern is this, is the text says that he's going to come back to rescue those who are eagerly waiting for his return. And there are many of you here this morning that are not waiting for him. You've been caught up in the world, and the world is singing a song that has led you astray like the Pied Piper. Your heart has wandered. Your eyes are not fixed upon Jesus. You're not waking in the morning with the anticipation that this could be the day that you're in the presence of the Lord. You are not eagerly waiting for his return. You're eagerly serving the flesh. You're eagerly following after lust and after the the sins of this light, the sins of this world. Your, Your heart has been captivated by other gods, by idolatry. And you're not worshiping the one true King of kings and Lord of lords. You're not waiting for him eagerly as you should. This morning, the Lord put upon my heart to give you an opportunity to repent. Just to say, Lord, forgive me for those areas in my life where I haven't been waiting for you. That I haven't been waiting upon the promise of your word. That my heart hasn't been captivated by you. That I'm not in love the way that I should be. Forgive me of those sins that I've allowed to creep back into my life that I got comfortable. You know, we come out of this Easter season and sometimes we hit this season a spiritual apathy or a spiritual hangover. Cameron and I were talking about it this morning. Spiritual hangover. Right? Go to the Lord this morning. Bow your heads with me. I'm going to give you an opportunity just to go before God this morning. Even before we continue on, just to give you an opportunity to repent. To turn from those things that you know are not pleasing the Lord. Those areas in your life that you've allowed the enemy to creep in. To sow seeds of doubt. To draw your heart away from the one true living God. Go to him this morning. Lift those things before him. Lay those things at his feet. Say, Lord, I don't want to live like this anymore. Lord, collectively as a congregation, we come to you this morning and we say we want to be a people who are eagerly waiting for your return. Lord, we don't want to live for this world. This world has nothing to offer us. When we try to quench our thirst at the well of this world, we're just going to wander away from that well still thirsting. But God, when we come to the living water, when we come to Jesus the Christ, when we come to the one who came and and gave his life and rose claiming victory over our sin, Lord, when we come to that one, that water will quench, that water will fill, that water will, will quench that thirst, will wash over us. Lord, that's what we desire to be filled with. We want the bread of life today. We don't want to be filling ourselves with the the junk of this world. We want the bread of life. We want the living water. God, we want to live as though you could return at any moment. We want to eagerly await the return of our Savior. And so, Lord, change our hearts. We call out in repentance this morning. We say, Lord, forgive us. Forgive us being consumed by money, materialism. Forgive us, Lord, for being consumed by gluttony and following after flesh and just satisfying the desires of the flesh. Forgive us for lust. Forgive us for bitterness and anger and resentment. Forgive us, Lord, of fear and doubt. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Wash your people today. Wash your people today and help us to be a people, 
Lord, who really truly live as though your word is true, who live as though your word is a promise to us that just as he came the first time to deal with sin, Jesus will come a second time, no longer to deal with, deal with sin, but to rescue those who wait for him. Lord, we are a people who wait for you. Lord, change our hearts. Make us more like you today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord some love this morning. Praise God, praise God. Turn around and greet somebody this morning. Say hello to them. Let them know you're glad that they made it back the Sunday after Easter. If you're watching from home, thank you for joining us. And we'd encourage you to fill out the connect card, the scan, uh, scan the QR code on your screen so that we can reach out and connect with you in a special way. We want to know those people that are uh, considering this congregation, their congregation, that maybe are just worshiping from home. So we thank you for joining us this morning. It's a blessing for you, or for us to have you uh, welcome us into your home like that. Praise God, praise God. Hey, why don't you stay standing as we pray over the offering this morning? Stay standing. Don't get too comfortable yet. Feel like it's better on your knees if I just tell you guys to keep standing. Amen? It's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning, isn't it? Amen? Yes. Let's go to the Lord and pray over the offering. Father, thank you this morning that we have an opportunity to give to the work of your kingdom. God, we want to partner with this work. Thank you, Lord, that you've entrusted to us resources and Lord, we just want to be faithful stewards of the resources you've entrusted to our care. God, help us to not hoard what is not ours, what belongs to you anyway. Lord, help us to release what we're supposed to release, what you've placed upon our hearts to release. God, give us a heart of expectation, Lord, that as we release, God, that we're just trusting. We trust, and Lord, that we would do this as a form of worship, that no one would feel compelled to do so uh, by anything or anyone other than the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, I pray that this would be a time of joy, that this would be a time of blessing, and, Lord, that you would just multiply what is given to meet the needs of this community as they receive the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Again, you may be seated this morning. The ushers are going to come forward, receive this morning's offering. Uh, there's many ways you can give. You can give through the offering that way. You can scan the QR code on your screen. You can drop it in the drop boxes out front. If you're visiting with us today, we want to welcome welcome you. We, we, don't, uh, we encourage you to, to just enjoy the service. Don't be compelled to give in any way. If you're just trying us out, if you're just checking to see what this is all about, we want to be a blessing to you today. Uh, but if you are visiting with us, we'd encourage you to fill out the QR code or scan the QR code to fill out the connect card. We want to be able to connect with you after service this next week to reach out to you, let you know what the church is doing, what we have to offer. And if you stop by the visitor center after service, there's a little gift with a little bit of information about the church, uh, a, a little devotional book there, some pens and notepad we'd like to give you guys that stuff after service if you guys go if you're visiting with us go check out that visitor center afterwards uh, we will not be having just so, to remind you we will not be having the coffee shop open after service but we will have plates available after service for you to go to support iron man you'll hear some uh, announcements about that in a little while, but we're going to Sunbeam after church, right? So I hope everyone will make it out. Again, I think you'll hear an announcement about that. A couple of announcements I want to make sure that I give. First off, uh, the uh, Conquer series is going to begin this Tuesday evening, uh, April 9th. Uh, see Pastor Dennis if you have any questions about that, or you can sign up in the app. This is for men who are maybe struggling with sexual addiction, some sort of lust, uh, and you want deliverance from that. It's an it's a excellent way for fathers to bring their sons, uh, just to guard against that, to bring those men together to be able to really seek God and what God's solution is in the spirit to conquer that lust of the flesh. And then for ladies, there's going to be uh, a uh, sexual integrity class that's going to start April 16th. And again, this is the women's side of this same coin. You can sign up for that in the church app as well. All right. And then one final thing. Uh, how many of you guys want to watch the Padres beat the Phillies? No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, th these, are all, these are the Philly people in the front, right? So... Yeah, that's the Philly people. That's about all of the Philly people right there, right? Uh, so if, you, if you're wanting to participate, we'd encourage you to do so. There's still tickets available on the church app. You're going to hear announcements the next couple of weeks. It's always a great time for the body of Christ to come together. We have like a whole few rows, sections that are, are, are rented out there or that we, we got the seats for so that you can come and enjoy the game together and enjoy some Christian fellowship as well. Again, that's April 26th, an evening game. So we'd encourage you to get your tickets online there as well. Amen? Let's take a look at what else is happening this week at Christ Community Church. Hey, Church. Thank you for joining us this morning. If you're tuning in online, we welcome you this morning as well. Check out these announcements for what's coming up at CCC. If you have surrendered your life to Christ, your first act of obedience is to be baptized. This act is essential because it is a proclamation to the world of your new life found in Christ. 
If you have already made a decision to follow Christ, but you have not yet been baptized, you can sign up on our CCC app for a one-hour class which will be held in the family room where you will learn about the essentials of baptism. Then at the end of the service, you will be able to participate in baptisms. I want to address those who are either new or those who have been coming a while but still have yet not got connected, informed, or involved here at CCC. Our church offers many different classes, life groups, and a number of different ministries you can serve in. In order to better inform you, we provide a covenant class where you can hear more about what we do, meet a couple of our pastors, and sign the CCC covenant. We will be having this one-hour class Sunday, April 21st, in the family room from 9 to 10 a.m. You can sign up for this class on our CCC app. Hey church, we are having a parents night out on Thursday, April 18th from 6 to 8 p.m. We want to give you parents an opportunity to have a date night while we watch your children. You can sign up your children ages 3 to 11 on our CCC IV app so we know how many volunteers we will need. And that's all for our announcements this morning. You can check out all the details to each of these announcements on our CCC app. On our app, you can also find daily drop devotions, give tithes, watch past sermons, and sign up to serve. Our midweek service is happening this Wednesday at 6.30 p.m. We also have a Awana for your younger kids, as well as youth group for your junior and high and high school students. Now let's get back to our worship service. Go ahead and um, stand with us as we continue to worship the Lord this morning.
as we sing one more um, song this morning, um, praising the Lord, um, just for who he is, um, I wanted to share a scripture, um, Matthew 7, 24 through 27, um, and it says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and be on that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against the house and it fell and great was the fall of it. And so from the scripture, we see that a proper foundation for our lives is necessary. And the proper foundation of our lives should be Christ. It should be him and his word and not just hearing his word, but also doing it. And um, many times our lives can look the same on the outside, but the real foundation of our lives is um, proven in the storm. We see what our foundation is, what our lives are built upon when storms come into our life. And so... Um, the wise man in this scripture is the believer, believer who builds his house on the rock of Christ. And so just as Pastor Chris mentioned earlier, um, what is in your heart? What are the desires of your heart? Um, and the desires of our hearts should be Christ. And if it's not, then when the flood comes, um, we will see what is our foundation, if it's Christ or not. And so as we sing this song, Firm Foundation, um, I just want to ask if Christ is your firm foundation, then to sing these words out, um, to declare that Christ is your foundation. And if he's not this morning, then you'll have an opportunity this morning. This is your opportunity to um, make him the foundation of your life. Um, so let's go ahead and sing to him this morning.
today. Father, you're a God who wins every single time. No mere mortal can thwart your awesome plans, Jesus, and for that I am so grateful. Our sinfulness could not stop you. Satan could not stop you because you are awesome. And from you, through you, and to you are all things, all the glory, Lord God, and we love you. And today, Lord, those who have been redeemed have gathered here today because, Jesus, we desperately love you, need you, and want you. But, God, sometimes our flesh gets in the way. Sometimes even me as a pastor, Lord, I get behind the pulpit and my flesh is there. Sometimes my brothers and sisters, they come to church not with ears to hear, but God, a fleshly heart. And Lord Jesus, I pray with all my heart that you would fill us with your spirit right now and you would remove the flesh because God, if there's one thing that we need, it's more of you and less of us. Oh God, would you change us today? Would you change us today, Lord? I pray for those who are here or watching online, Lord Jesus. Your spirit is there with those that are watching online, Lord God. Your spirit is not in a place. It is in our hearts, Lord God. And I pray over every person, God, who is hearing this message today, that, God, they would not hear me, but, Jesus, they would hear you. And that, God, today we would change all of us to be more like you. God, your ways are higher than our ways. And we need you right now, Jesus. So God, have your way in this place. Have your way in our hearts. May we be a clay that can be molded more into the image of Jesus right now. Please, Lord, remove my flesh. Remove my thoughts. Remove my words. May I simply be a mouthpiece for your glory. You are a good God. Even when we are bad, Lord, you are good. Even when we are faithless, you are faithful. And we love you, Lord. So God, do a mighty work today in this place. In Jesus' holy and precious name that died on the cross. And as we celebrate every day, you rose again. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. We'll go ahead and have a seat this morning. And as you're being seated, go ahead and turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, as that's where we're going to primarily be this morning. And as you're turning there, if you don't know who I am, my name is Cameron Colas. I'm the youth pastor here at Christ Community Church. And as you may have noticed, there's a lot of young people up here on the stage. And we're excited because it doesn't matter how old or how young you are, Jesus can use you. So as you're turning there to 2 Timothy chapter 3, I'm going to go ahead and start reading. We're going to be reading the first seven verses. And if you're not there yet, feel free to just go ahead and listen. God's word is powerful, even if it's just heard. So go ahead and follow along as I read this out loud. But understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. 
avoid such people. For among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. Now go ahead and skip down if you're in your Bibles to chapter 4, and we're going to pick up in verse 3. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And Lord, once again, we just ask your blessing on the preaching of your word. We love you. We give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Any last words? You've probably heard that famous question right before someone in a movie or a book or a story is killed off. Some famous last words that I'd like to recount. And when we say famous last words, we don't mean these are literally the last words that someone said, but rather the last recorded words of someone who was alive. Some famous last words would be from George Orwell, who said, At 50, everyone has the face he deserves. Leonardo da Vinci said, I have offended God and mankind because my work did not reach the quality it should have. Ruth Bader Ginsburg said, My most fervent wish is that I will not be replaced until a new president is installed. We are fascinated by someone's last words because they give us deep insight into what was important to that man or woman as they faced the inevitable foe, death. The book of 2 Timothy is a composition of the famous last words of the Apostle Paul. Arguably, Paul did more in the spreading of Christianity than anyone else in human history. Not only did Paul write more letters that contribute to our Bible than any other apostle, but he also planted more churches than any other apostle in the ancient world. Paul, like the other apostles, was killed before Jesus came back. According to church tradition, he was beheaded by the Roman government under the rule of Nero. While Paul was in prison, he could sense that his execution was coming soon. He used the time that he had left to encourage those that were under him. 2 Timothy is the last letter that Paul wrote before he died. He alludes multiple times throughout the letter that his end was drawing near. He also, throughout the letter, pours out his affections for his disciple Timothy, who was like a son to him. Throughout the letter, the overtone Paul is conveying to Timothy is to stand for the gospel, even if everyone else abandons you. Now, Timothy was a young pastor at a church that Paul had planted. And in the letter, Paul identifies two main adversaries to the church of Jesus. And we just read about them. He talks about ungodly teachers and an ungodly culture. Timothy was fighting a war within the church on both these fronts simultaneously. There was an ungodly culture that was surrounding the church, and there were ungodly teachers infiltrating the church. Does that sound familiar to anyone? The Church of America is currently fighting the same war with the same battles Timothy and Paul were. Ungodly teachers and an ungodly culture. You can visibly see both making their way into the church today. In regards to an ungodly culture, as we read the first seven verses of 2 Timothy 3, you saw a long list of problems that are in this culture. Each of these sinful actions stem in some way, shape, or form from self-absorption. It's fascinating because the three main messages of our modern culture stem from self-absorption. Self-love, self-esteem, and self-worth. While each of these self-absorbed ideologies may tickle our ears and cause our hearts to flutter, the reality is that they are in direct opposition to what the true and living God commands of those that follow him. While the world encourages self-love, the Bible teaches self-denial. See Luke 9.23. While the world teaches self-esteem, the Bible teaches us to esteem others. See Philippians 2.3. While the world teaches self-worth, the Bible teaches that Christ is the one who makes us worthy. See 2 Corinthians 3 verse 5. When you observe Christian content in our culture, like movies, TikTok, self-help books, etc., you see all three of these godless ideologies sneaking into the church. And the question becomes, 
how has this godless culture infiltrated the church in the first place? I mean, it's not surprising that the culture lives in a manner that opposes God. But how is it possible that these ideologies have infiltrated and influenced the people of God? Well, that brings us to our second front that we are fighting, ungodly teachers. It doesn't take very much effort to see where the false teachers are. In the passage we read in 2 Timothy 4, it is the people within the church who promote ungodly and unqualified teachers. And the reason Paul gives in what we read for people exalting godless teachers is because the people want to feel comfortable about their own sin. There are three main ways that the ungodly teachers excuse immorality from within the church. They add to God's word, they subtract from God's word, and they twist God's word. And you see all three of these things happening in the church today. In regards to subtracting from God's word, the Queen James Bible, released in 2012, is a pro-gay theology Bible that seeks to remove the sting of the sin of homosexuality. In regards to adding to God's word, the Passion Translation, released in 2011, significantly changed how some passages of the Bible are read. In fact, to put it in perspective, the book of Psalms in the Passion Translation is 55% longer than any normal translation. Now, the book of Psalms is already really long, so why is it 55% longer? In regards to the twisting of God's word, the list would be too long for this message. In fact, when I was preparing this message, I was a little bit over time, and I realized I had to cut some part out. I was going to go in depth into the amount of teachers that twist God's word, but that is not for this message, maybe another time. I don't have a problem with people name dropping because it's important for the church to know those who are twisting God's word for their own selfish gain. For the sake of time, though, we're not going to go over specifics. But the point is that there are many men. And when I say many, I mean very many. Very many men that are behind pulpits on YouTube using platforms to use the gospel as a tool for selfish gain. We should pray for these men. And I want you to know that I do. I don't speak that judgmentally. And if time permitted, I would happily spend much more time explaining how the ungodly culture paired with ungodly teachers has taken away from, added to, and outrightly twisted the word of God. The point is that the word of God is under attack. We as a church need to accept this simple truth. America was founded on Christian principles, but it is no longer a Christian nation. The pastors of America are scandalous, the leaders of America are wicked, and the people of America are far from God. Now, why say all this? Well, I promise you I'm not trying to bum you out. I have two very important reasons for why I introduce this message in this manner. One, to expose the reality of where we are as a nation, but also, two, to offer a solution. As Timothy was reading all these descriptions of the godless society and godless teachers, I am certain that his heart would have started to grow heavy. But Paul was not about to leave his son in the faith without a solution to the godless society that surrounded him. Paul was going to give his disciple the antidote that would get him through it all. And the same solution to Timothy's perverse generation is available to you today. Sandwiched in between the two passages that we read, between the godless culture and the godless teachers, we find God's solution, and that is God's word. God's antidote for the church in the midst of a godless society with godless teachers is his holy word. And today we are going to observe eight characteristics of God's word and how it is the solution for us today. So the first point, let's jump right on into it. Hopefully you're there in 2 Timothy 3. We're going to start off in verse 14. And the first point is that God's word brings salvation. God's word brings salvation. Go ahead and look at 2 Timothy 3 as we start in verse 14. But as for you, remember this is a letter written to Timothy. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. And how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings. And here it is which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Throughout 2 Timothy, we see Paul making remarks about Timothy's personal life. Now this shows the affection that Paul had for Timothy. He was intimately involved in his life as a father to a son. 
But not only that, for us today, it also gives us background into Timothy's upbringing. From a young age, Timothy was acquainted with God's word, the sacred writings. Paul prefaces the power of God's word with an appeal to what God had already done in Timothy's life. The first area of strength that God's word has is that it is able to make one wise for salvation through Jesus. But what does this mean? What what does it mean to make one wise for salvation? Well, throughout the scriptures, if you wouldn't mind me going on a little bit of a rabbit trail, there are three revelations that God has given humans to point us to him. The first revelation that God has given us that direct us to him is our hearts. You don't have to turn there, but Ecclesiastes 3.11, a good verse to write down and read later. He has made, that is God, has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, and here it is, he has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. One of my favorite things that I have ever heard from behind this pulpit is once when Pastor Chris said, atheists claim to not believe in God, but God does not believe in atheists. Sometimes when I'm giving the gospel to someone, I'll use this as a tool to segue into the gospel. I'll sometimes ask them what they think happens after they die. Now let me tell you, not once has anyone ever replied to me, gee, I've never really thought about that. Why has no one ever replied with that? Because every person, every one of you, at some point in your life, has laid in your bed in the dark and asked the question, what happens when I die? Deep down, we know that life does not end after death. There is an eternity, and we all need to be prepared for it. And the concept of eternity is a revelation about reality that God has placed in our hearts. However, look at the qualifier Ecclesiastes gives us about the revelation of the heart. Right at the end of the verse, he says that God did place eternity in our hearts, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from beginning to end. You see, although God places a spark of curiosity in our hearts in regards to himself and eternity, we are unable to arrive at that truth on our own. And that brings us to the second revelation that God has given us. God has given us the revelation of our hearts. He's also given us the revelation of creation. We see this in Romans chapter 1, verses 19 through 20, where Paul says, For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse." What God is saying through Romans 1, 19 through 20, is that he has revealed himself through his creation. It is illogical to believe that there is no God. Why? Well, because it is illogical to see a fully constructed house and not believe in an architect. It is illogical to see the intricacies of a pocket watch and not believe in a watchmaker. And in the same manner, it is illogical to see the complexity of the universe and not believe in an almighty creator. Yes, you can clap for that. Praise God. (laughs) As if you guys need my permission. Students in my youth group will often come up to me and ask me how I know that there is a God, that he really exists. And this verse is the first place I take them to. And then I tell them to go outside and look at nature. You see, whether you look out into the complexity of space or you look down into the intricacies of a plant or even if you're just looking face to face with the beauty of a human being, you know deep down that there is a creator. There is no way around you. Creation is the checkmate that God has given us. You are without excuse. You know there is a God. However, with that being said, yes, you can clap for that. Go ahead. Stop asking for my permission. (laughs) If you're going to clap, clap boldly. (laughs) However, with this revelation of creation, neither the heart of man nor the complexity of creation can truly bring us to the living God. It can't bring us into a relationship with him. They are like compasses that point us in the right direction, but they can't get us there. They cannot bring us to the truth of who God is or how he has worked in creation. And that brings us to the third and best revelation that God has given us, and that is His word. 
And that is what Paul is trying to convey to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, that this word is God's best revelation that he has ever given us. Out of all three of these compasses, it is God's word that speaks the loudest and most clear in regards to the person of God. In Romans 10.17, it says, So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You see, it is the word of God that speaks to the heart of man, the person of God, and his sovereign plan of redemption. Paul's point is that God's word is all you really need in order to bring someone to salvation. You see, I I believe that knowledge and philosophical arguments are good when it comes to the gospel, but there is nothing that is on the same level as God's word. God's word navigates our hearts and speaks directly to every single one of us. You may not be a very knowledgeable person. You may not be a very eloquent person. You may not even be a very strong person. But I will say this, that if you know God's word, then you've got all you need in terms of the gospel. The spirit of God will always utilize the word of God inside the person of God to bring someone to salvation. Let me say that again. Let that soak in. The spirit of God will always use the word of God in the person of God to bring someone to salvation. Don't feel like you need to have all the answers to every theological question in order to spread the gospel. If you simply know the word, then you know the gospel and you can be used by God. That brings us to our second point. Not only does God's word bring salvation, but God's word is from God. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16, the first half. It says, all scripture. How much is all? There you go. Everyone say all. All scripture is breathed out by God. Now your first thought may have been when I read that point that God's word is from God, you may have thought, Cameron, that's a little obvious that the Bible is from God. However, I'd like to inform you today that this simple point is controversial across churches in America. Grace Point Church in Nashville, Tennessee, put out an Instagram post where they said this, quote, As progressive Christians, we're open to the tensions and inconsistencies in the Bible. We know that it can't live up to the impossible modern standards. We strive to more clearly articulate what Scripture is and isn't. The Bible isn't the Word of God, self-interpreting, a science book, an answer-slash-rule book, inerrant or infallible. The Bible is a product of community, a library of texts, multivocal, a human response to God, living and dynamic, end quote. The post by Grace Point Church is reflective of so many churches in America today. Churches are slowly buying more and more into the idea that the Bible is maybe not from God. I praise Jesus because that's not our church. That's not our church. Praise Jesus, yes. But if we are not careful and do not stay vigilant this evil and wicked perspective will slither into our midst undetected. Pay attention to how Paul describes scripture. He says it is breathed from, what, hold up, breathed out by God. I'd like to ask you a question. Why do or why should you believe in the Bible? Is it because a pastor says so? Is it because your parents did Well, Paul makes the appeal that scripture is to be believed and obeyed because it is breathed out by God. Some versions will say inspired by God. However, the word inspired doesn't convey the point that Paul is trying to make. Paul is trying in somewhat of like a poetic manner to explain that scripture comes directly from the mouth of God to us. In the commentary, Exalting Jesus, the author says, quote, just as God spoke the universe into existence so also he breathed out his word in scripture. God breathed out his holy word, end quote. An argument that many college professors seek to make with the hopes of collapsing a young Christian's faith is, well, the Bible was written by men. Although no pastor will ever deny this, this small statement shakes the faith of some Christians because the statement itself seeks to equalize the Bible with every other religious book. Can I just say, this Bible, this book, is far above 
every other religious text. The Vedas got nothing on this. The Quran has nothing on this. This is the word of God. And some professors will try to say, no, 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 the Bible itself doesn't believe that. But look at what Peter says in 2 Peter 1.21. For no prophecy in the context of scripture, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Although the men writing the Bible, 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 were flawed men just like all of us, the Holy Spirit carried and equipped them to write the Bible both inerrantly and infallibly. I had a professor one time try to demote the authority of the Bible in the life of Christians by saying, some Christians believe the Bible fell out of the sky and onto their coffee table, but nothing could be further from the truth. And although he's not wrong that the Bible literally didn't fall out of the sky, the miracle of the Bible should not be made light of. You see, this book, this Bible, was written by 40 different authors over the course of 1,500 years, composed by peasants, kings, philosophers, fishermen, poets, and scholars, written in three different languages, written during war and peace, famine and bounty, joy and despair. And yet, somehow, it contains a timeless message, uncontradictory, because it comes from an unchanging God. And yet, he used changing, fickle men that fall short of his glory. Only God could do that. And any self-respecting historian will have to tell you, have to admit, that the Bible is different from any historical or religious document. It is far more credible, it is far more accurate, and it never contradicts itself. And the reason why people try to demote the Bible and say that it's just a book written by men is because people love their sin and they know that if this does come from God, they have to actually repent of their sin and turn to him. Although the Bible was written by many different men in many different periods of history, it was one faithful, never-changing God working behind the scenes, preserving his perfect word. The Bible is from the mouth of God. The culture, both outside and inside the church, wants you to believe that this book is less than what it is. And although it was weak men that penned this book, it was the sovereign, true, and living God that gave it to us. The fact that the Bible is from the mouth of God should tell us that it is both valuable and authoritative in our lives. It is for no small reason that the psalmist equates the word of God to the name of God in Psalm 138 too. And it is for no small reason that the longest chapter in the Bible is all about how how great God's word is in Psalm 119. The problem is that so many homes and so many churches have made small the word of God and exalted the words of men. God's word is, it brings salvation. God's word is from God. But thirdly, God's word is good for teaching. God's word is good for teaching. Now, the next few characteristics of God that we're going to go over, we're going to talk about what it's good for, what it's useful for, what it should be used for in our lives. Look at 2 Timothy 3.16. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching. Paul is trying to get the idea across to Timothy that it is God's word that is useful and good for teaching. If you want to know about God, humanity, and how he wants us to live, you are taught through God's word. Unfortunately, too many men get behind a pulpit and give a 20 to 40 minute sermon based on life experiences, funny stories, and outlandish sermon illustrations that have little or nothing to do with God. Charles Spurgeon once said, I believe, gifted by the Holy Spirit to say this, a time will come when instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, the church will have clowns entertaining the goats. So many pastors today seek to entertain rather than to teach. And yet Psalms 19 verse 7, listen to what it says about the word of God. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. And listen to this, making wise the simple. When pastors use church to entertain, they disrespect and disregard all that God could be doing in their congregation. It's not only flashy preachers that are missing the mark though. Too many everyday Christians neglect the effect of God's word that it could be having in their personal lives. They refuse to sit and let the Holy Spirit teach them through his word. 
Rather than hearing from the true and living God, they've got more important things to do. They're grinding out a battle pass. They're binging the latest Netflix show. They're getting some good old-fashioned me time. But the honest truth is that by neglecting God's word in one's personal life, the unintentionally prideful Christian makes the statement that they have no need for God's counsel in their lives. John MacArthur said in the Bible commentary, quote, the scripture provides the comprehensive and complete body of divine truth necessary for life and godliness, end quote. If you were to come to me for counsel and say that you don't know what God's will is for your life, my first question would be, when was the last time you read your Bible? Within many Christian homes, the word of God is neglected as a teacher. We default to experience worldly wisdom and any source of knowledge outside of God. But the reality is that God's word has something to say about every area of your life. The Christian parent is shocked when their young person walks away from Christ. And yet, oftentimes, it is Christ who has been neglected the entirety of their childhood. Rather than going to church, they were at sporting events. Rather than quoting the Bible, the parent quotes Sigmund Freud. Rather than defaulting to the Bible as the ultimate authority in the home, the parent replies to questions with the statement, because I said so. Good knowledge comes from good teachers. But the question I'd like to ask you is, who is your teacher? Is it Freud? Is it Oprah? Is it Dr. Phil? Is it the Kardashians? Or is it the Holy Spirit through the knowledge of the word? Your teacher, who your teacher is, will be obvious in the way that you choose to make decisions. The next thing that God is good, God's word is good for, God's word is good for convicting. If you continue on, it says that it is profitable for teaching and reproof. The word Paul uses in the Greek is translated reproof. But reproof or reprove is not really a word that we often use in our modern vocabulary. The Greek word is often used to say rebuke or call out or to convict. Listen to what it says in Hebrews chapter 4 verse 12. For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Have you ever been driving and you got a little distracted? Maybe you started to drift a little bit because you got an alarm that went off on your phone, or maybe a light popped up on your dashboard, or maybe you were just too lost in the conversation with someone sitting next to you. Whatever the case... If you've ever been distracted while driving and you started to drift, you might be familiar with the rumbling that of course occurs shortly after. The rumbling and vibration is caused by something called a rumble strip. The rumble strip is on the edge of the road and it is designed to alert the driver that he or she is beginning to veer off the road and needs to correct their course, otherwise they're going to crash. When you're driving on the road and you hit the rumble strip, none of you would think for a moment, man, I wish they'd remove these loud, obnoxious bumps. They're distracting me from what I'm trying to do. You're grateful for the rumble strip because without it, you would have gotten into an accident. This is the picture that Paul is trying to paint in regards to the word of God. Our loving father has given us a rumble strip for our spiritual walk with him. As we travel through this world on our way to eternity, we may go through seasons where sin sneaks into our lives. And if the word of God is constantly in our faces, it will act as a rumble strip. It alerts us that we are veering off course. It lets us know that we need to correct our way, otherwise we are going to crash. We can, by all means, ignore the word of God and not deal with the problem. We can choose to be annoyed at the conviction that it brings into our lives. However, the reality is that if we choose to neglect the conviction or rumbling the word causes in our lives, then we are going to crash. The sad truth is that many Christians neglect the powerful conviction that the word of God brings into their lives. Rather than being in the word daily, they're on social media hourly. Rather than listen to the preaching pastor on Sundays, they're more concerned with fantasy scores. Rather than listen to godly music and content, they fill their minds and their cars with junk that reflects this world. But the word of God tells us what needs to be corrected in order to avoid destruction. The next thing that the word of God is good for, it is good for correcting. God is gracious enough 
to both point out the sin in your life as well as tell you how to deal with the sin in your life. I love the way J. Adams put it in his commentary on 2 Timothy. He said, quote, If the Bible convicts you of sin, knocks you flat on your face, it also picks you up, dusts you off, gets you out of the trouble you brought on yourself, and heads you in the right direction for the future. End quote. The Bible doesn't only warn you that your life is heading off road. It also tells you how to get back on track. Too many people think that God just wants to point out the flaws in their lives, that God gets some twisted kick out of the fact that you're not perfect. But nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, when it comes to your life, God has a very intentional plan. Look at what it says in Romans 8, 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. God doesn't point out your sin to laugh at you. God doesn't point out your sin to condemn you. God points out your sin in order that it may be corrected. God wants to make you into the image of Christ. And it is through the word that he gives you the game plan you need in order to walk in righteousness. There is one last thing that God's word is good for. It is good for training. Specifically, this verse says that it is good for training in righteousness. Now, many people train for many different purposes. And typically when we hear the word train, we think of something like for a sport. You train to be faster. You train to be stronger. You train to be better. But the picture that Paul is trying to paint is different from how one trains for a sport. In other areas of scripture, we see Paul encouraging us to train in righteousness like a vigorous sport. However, Paul is not trying to convey this message in regards to the scriptures. The Greek word he used for training is paideia, and it means to discipline in a manner similar to how one would discipline a child. You see, it's not enough to be taught God's word, to be convicted by God's word, or even to be corrected by God's word. In a disciplined manner, you actually need to walk in it. Paul is wanting to encourage Timothy to use God's word to daily walk in alignment with God's word. If you want to walk in the blessings of God's word, you need to both daily and intentionally choose to train in it. There is a practicing that needs to happen. How does a child learn to clean up his room or to make his bed? Well, he may need to be shown a few times, but ultimately he needs to simply choose to do what has been shown to him. When Katie and I were teaching our children to clean their rooms, we had to show them by example a few times, but now they simply practice what they have been taught. In James 1.22, the apostle says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Too many Christians are deceived in our churches today. They've heard God's word. They've been taught God's word. They've learned what God calls them to do through his word. But they are deceived because all they do is listen. They never actually do. When we walk in sin, we walk in darkness, death, and destruction. But when we train in righteousness, we walk in light, life, and the newness of Christ. God loves his children too much to let them continue on in their sinful ways. In fact, he plans to train you and discipline you to be like Jesus. Look at what it says in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 7. And have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is for discipline that you have to endure. God is treating you as sons. For what son is there whom the father does not discipline? To experience the blessings of God, one, uh, excuse me, to experience the blessings of God's word, one must fully submit to God's word by being obedient to what it calls them to do. And God's word calls you out of sin. God's word calls you into righteousness. And you're constantly going to see that theme over and over. You're constantly going to see scripture calling you, encouraging you, training you to change the way you live. To be effectively trained in God's word is to actually do what it says to do. Unfortunately, there's this weird idea in the culture that some guy has to love you exactly the way you are and never change. But God doesn't love you that way. Although he loves you as you are, he has no intention of leaving you that way. The next point in regards to God's word, God's word is sufficient. God's word is sufficient. 
Look at what it says. We're going to read both these verses together because I think it packs a much stronger punch. Look at what it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 through 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. The term man of God was used by Paul in another area of scripture referring to church leadership. However, this statement is not only true for the pastor or the elder. God's word is meant to complete all of us and equip all all of us. In other words, it enables us to meet the demands of godly ministry and godly living. It effectively prepares us for the good works that God has called us to do. No matter what role God has placed you in, he can equip you for it through his word. Do you want to be a good spouse? The word of God can equip you. Do you want to be a good single? The word of God can equip you. Do you want to be a good boyfriend or girlfriend? The word of God can equip you. Do you want to be a good parent? The word of God can equip you. Do you want to be a good student, good friend, or even simply a good Christian? For all these and so much more, the word of God can equip you. The problem is that the church has come to believe that the word of God is not sufficient in every area of life. They look to the word of God as something supplemental to the advice that they can get from other books, teachers, and studies. But as far as society has advanced, I get it. It can be easy to buy into the temptation that the Bible is outdated and secondary. We think that in order to be a good parent, I need to see what Dr. Phil has to say first. In order to be a good spouse, I need to see the latest article by Psychology Today. In order to resolve my childhood trauma, I need to see what Sigmund Freud has to say first. And I don't want to make light of any of these issues. But the Bible speaks to a lot more than we give it credit for. Peter, James, Paul, and the rest of the early church did just fine in regards to anxiety, depression, addiction, and so much more without modern psychology. It's not like the church stuck around, sitting on their hands, waiting for 1,900 years for some psychological Messiah to come and pick up where the Bible left off. It didn't. The Bible has given sufficient advice without the help of Freud, Phil, or Oprah. If you have trouble... You're supposed to go to the expert. When your car is broken, you go to a mechanic. When your house is on fire, you call the fire department. And when your life is in shambles, maybe it would be best to turn to the God that created it. The Bible is truly sufficient in regards to life and godliness. But the problem is that we are too prideful and don't want to do life God's way. I want to encourage you today, friends, stop supplementing God and trust that his word is sufficient. Isaiah 55, 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts, this is God talking, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. The question is, which advice do you want? Do you want the wisdom of man, or do you want the wisdom of God? Now, I know that we're running out of time, but in talking about God's word, I genuinely believe I would be sinful if I left out this last point. You see, it's true that God's word does bring salvation. God's word truly is from the mouth of God. God's word reproves, corrects, and so much more, everything we've talked about so far. But if I left out this last point, I would be wrong as a pastor. God's word points to Jesus. Listen to what Jesus said in John 5, 39 to 40. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. If you read this passage in context, Jesus is addressing the men who are constantly opposing him, the Pharisees. Now, if you've ever read the Gospels, the term Pharisees probably sounds like a dirty word. They were the religious leaders of Jesus' time. They were constantly his enemies pushing back against him, trying to trap him and prove that he was not the Messiah. However, when you look at their history, the history of the Pharisees, they didn't start off so bad. In many of your Bibles, there's a page in between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew. This page divides the Old Testament from the New Testament. It pretty much tells us 
the time between where we were waiting for the Messiah and the arrival of the Messiah. But that little page, what you may not realize, represents 400 years of silence from God. You see, during that time period, God was not speaking through the prophets. Between Malachi and Matthew, there was no new revelation from God. And God was still working in human history and with the Jews, but he just wasn't speaking to them. And when you look at the history, it's almost kind of like the Jewish people had this what now kind of an attitude. They were just kind of waiting. And it was during this time of silence that the Pharisees began. The Pharisees believed that God was silent because the people had been disobedient to his word. So what this religious sect decided to do was come together and wholeheartedly worship God. They chose to be more committed to the commandments of God. They determined that they would be pure in the eyes of their God. And in some ways, I personally admire their zeal. The problem was that their entire religion focused on themselves and how they would achieve religious purity. It was no longer about God. It had slowly evolved into a man-made system and set of rules. Because their religion was so set on them, they were completely blind when God actually showed up. And if we are not careful, we can fall into the same trap the religious Pharisees did. We can read our Bibles every day and know it backwards, forwards, and somehow diagonally. But if we are seeking some religious accolade outside of Jesus himself, then we will miss him completely. Christianity and the Bible is not about all that we can do for the kingdom of God. The entire Bible points to the fact that we need a Savior. Holding a Bible in his hand, sitting on the couch, talking to his kids about an amusement park being too expensive, the ever-wise Homer Simpson said, everything's too expensive these days. Look at this Bible I got. Fifteen bucks and talk about a preachy book. Everybody's a sinner except for this guy. Now, I don't watch The Simpsons. I don't suggest watching The Simpsons. And would certainly never go to The Simpsons for spiritual advice. However, even a broken clock is right twice a day. And then this one tiny 10-second excerpt, an adult cartoon show got right what most Christians completely miss. No man has ever been good enough to approach God. On your own strength, you just can't do it. If you read through the entirety of the Old Testament from Genesis to Malachi, you're going to see one common theme, and that is that men mess up. Romans 3.23 says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And you see that all throughout the Old Testament. Men falling short. The very first book of the Bible is filled with so much ungodly sex, murder, lying, and deception that by the sixth chapter, God hits the restart button on humanity in a worldwide flood. It doesn't get any better once you get out of the first book. You see prophets being insufficient. You see kings falling short. You see priests messing up. And it's because we needed a better prophet, priest, and king, and that was Jesus Christ. We are all sinners separated from God, and that's the ginormous overtone of the Bible. We've all fallen short, and we're all in need of a Savior. Even though we are all rebellious enemies of God, the beautiful message of the gospel is that God was gracious and he loved us and he died for us to draw you close. Every other religion is all about how we need to reach up to God. But Christianity is about God reaching down to us. You can't stop being angry. You can't stop being lustful. You can't stop being prideful, self-centered, let alone make it to heaven on your own. You're just not good enough. Please listen to a dying man, to dying men. You need Jesus. What is impossible for man is possible with God. Jesus lived a sinless life, died the death we deserved, and took the wrath of God upon himself and rose again three days later to redeem all who would believe on him. What the Bible does is whether you're a Christian or not, it points you to the cross and your need for a Savior. If you're not a Christian, you need Jesus to save you from the wrath of God. And if you are a Christian, you need Jesus to save you from yourself on a daily basis. The question I would like to close with today is have you allowed the word to bring you and your family close to Jesus? 
I'd like to read one more passage before we end. In Romans chapter 12, we see an interesting verse in verse 2. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. There is a culture out there. There are teachers out there that want you to look like them and not like Jesus. But can I just tell you, in as much as the world wants to conform you to itself, there is a gracious God that wants to conform you more into his image. The reality is that too many churches have forsaken the concept of sacredness. That this word is sacred. That this church is sacred. That our God's name is sacred. We have allowed what is holy to sit on our shelves and collect dust and become an afterthought in our homes. But if we will repent of our sins and hold high what ought to be esteemed, we can see God do a mighty work amongst us. Please, friends, hear me out. Forsake what is worthless and cling to what is valuable. Make room in your life for your Savior. Remove what is evil and cling to what is righteous. As Pastor Chris said earlier before I got up here, Jesus is returning and the time is close. Are you ready for the return of your Savior? Or will you be like the Pharisees and completely miss his arrival? We're going to transition into a time of communion right now. And I love communion. It is so, so good because it's more than just snack time. It's not that at all. And sadly, I've actually seen many Christians equate it to that. But when we refer to communion as snack time, it's, we're just honoring something that Christ gave us to remember himself. But there was something that happened before Jesus took the Last Supper. You see, we do read in the scriptures that Jesus took the bread, he broke it, and he split it with his disciples. He took the wine, he drank it, and he passed it around to his disciples. And that is what communion is a reflection on. It reminds us of the sacrifice Jesus gave, his body that was given for us, his blood that was spilled for us. But before they partook in communion, something happened. And if you need a communion cup, please raise your hand. We have people walking around that would love to get you one. If you need a communion cup, we have some people up here in the front and the back over here. And actually, a little trick with the communion cup, you can actually just bend it forward, and then it'll snap, and it makes it easier to open. Anyways, that's not important. But something really beautiful happened before Jesus partook in the Last Supper with his disciples. In fact, if you'll permit me to read an excerpt of Scripture, in John chapter 13, there was this custom where the lowest of low servants would wash the guest's feet. Now, that's already pretty gross. But when you're in the time of Jesus, you got poop, you got dirt, and it's just collecting under your sandaled feet. It's really, really gross. And Jesus, in this moment before dinner, he didn't look at Peter. He said, go get a towel and a wash bin. I'm the son of God. You come serve me. Although he could have, and I think he would have been right in doing that. No, Jesus didn't call one of his disciples to serve. In John chapter 13, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. As you continue reading on, you see Peter, and he says, no, 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 Jesus, don't wash my feet, because he realizes that Jesus should not be doing that. But Jesus says, no, 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 I've got this. I need to wash your feet or you have no part with me. And Peter says, no, 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 wait, wait, just wash my whole body then. Peter, Jesus is like, no, no, you don't understand. You've been washed. I just need to wash your feet. You see, what communion is, it's a call to repentance. Because as we walk through this world, we pick up dirt on our hearts. We mess up, we fall short, and we forget from where we came. We forget what Christ brought us out of. And what communion is meant to be, is meant to be an opportunity to return to the Savior that loved us and died for us. So as we've been talking about God's word and the effect that it has on our lives, I just have to ask, before we take communion, is there anyone here who is far from God? Because here's the thing, Jesus doesn't want you to take communion if you're not right with him. You're coming in an unholy manner to something that is very holy. 
And so what I'd like to provide for you is an opportunity to repent of your sin right now. If you are a Christian who has been just neglecting God's word, you've been walking in sin, whatever the case, you fill in the blank, but you know you need to repent today, can I just ask that you would stand today and boldly repent of your sin? And let me tell you, if I was sitting with you, I'd stand up right now because I know that I fall short of God's glory often and I need to repent of my sin and I fall at the feet of my Savior and say, Jesus, please wash me again. I'm sorry. I repent of my sin and I turn to you. And the great thing about God is it doesn't matter what you've done. Jesus, no matter how dirty your heart is, he will always get on his knees and wash your heart if you will but simply come to him. So is there anyone here who needs to repent of sin today? They need to get right with God. If you need to repent of sin, please stand. And if you are someone who is not right with God, you've never had a relationship with God, you've never repented of your sin, you've never come to Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Please stand as well, because you really shouldn't take this if you're not a Christian. This is for Christians. But the great thing is, you can become a Christian right now. If you will believe in Jesus and repent in your heart from your sin, turn from your sin, turn to Jesus, he will give you eternal life. For all of you who are standing, I'm going to give a moment. I'm going to pray over you. But in your hearts, pray simultaneously and repent of any sin that's there. No matter how dirty, the great thing is, 1 John 1, 9 says that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. Faithful in that he'll do it every single time and just in that it has already been paid on the cross. Jesus, we come before you reverently, reminded of your death, the terrible price our sin cost you. And yet it costs us nothing. Jesus, may we be a people that turns from our sin and turns to you. May we be holy as you are holy, God. You are the thrice holy God. From you, through you, and to you are all things. And the last thing we deserve is redemption. But you give it to us. And I thank you for my brothers and sisters that have stood and they've said, Jesus, I don't want my sin. I want you. And I thank you, God, because I know that you have forgiven them since they have repented of their sin. They have confessed their sin to you and they have turned to you, the living God that brings life. You are the living water that brings life to those that are dry. We thank you for that. Thank you for your body you gave. Thank you for your blood you spilled. We do not deserve it, but we are grateful for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Go ahead and have a seat, and we're going to take communion together. And after we are done here, after we're done taking communion, if you have repented of sin and you would like to come get prayer, there will be a team up here that can pray for you. If there is anyone here that would like to give their life to Christ, or maybe you did during that prayer, praise Jesus, come up and talk to someone, because we are a family, and we walk through this life together. But that being said, let's go ahead and take communion together. If you'll peel the top layer It reminds us of the body of Jesus Christ that was given for us. And Jesus, in that moment, he broke the bread, he gave thanks, he passed it around. He said, take, eat. This is my body that is broken for you. Do so in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he passed it around. He said, take, drink. This is my blood that is spilled for you do so in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we remember what Jesus did for us until he comes again. We have a faithful God and Savior that's coming back. And let me tell you, if you have drifted from your walk with the Lord, you don't have to. And Jesus can bring you back. So with that, we're going to close in a couple of worship songs. The prayer team is going to come on up here, and I really want to encourage you, come up and get right with Jesus if you need to. Lord, we thank you for your love and your faithfulness that you have given us, not just on the cross, but Jesus, you are faithful to us every day as a good, faithful husband. We love you, we thank you, and we ask your blessing on the rest of this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
This is my surrender. Here is where I lay down every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender. Our sin truly 
is great. Your grace, your love is greater. And God, I look around at my brothers and sisters that have repented of their sin. They want you, Jesus. They're at the altar crying out for you. Jesus, we pray that you would continue to work, continue to move through your Holy Spirit because God, we are a people that wants you. While the culture can reject you, while evil teachers can reject you, we will not, Jesus. We come to you desiring more of you because you are a faithful and loving God. Thank you, Jesus, for all that you're doing in our hearts. We pray that you would continue to move, continue to work. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Listen, we don't want to squash what the Lord is doing right now. In fact, what's happening right now is far greater than anything else that's going to happen outside of those doors. Amen. And so if you still need to come down and get prayer, there is room at the altar. There are those that would love to pray with you, and we're here for you. So if you need to come down, there's still time. Please come. But as we get ready to close out the service, I really want to encourage you. They're going to do a couple more songs. We are going to be heading out to Sunbeam right after church. So please head out that way. We're going to have activities and fellowship. It's going to be great. It's got nothing on what's going on right now, but it's still going to be awesome. And that being said, we are going to be bringing our own lunches out there. So if you need to get a lunch, maybe consider swinging by the uh, table right outside where they're going to be doing a fundraiser for the Iron Man ministry. Please support the ministries. We can't do it without you guys. So please go by and support them. Thank you guys so much. Praise God. Let's continue to worship Jesus together. I'm caught up in your presence. I just want to sit here at your feet. I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I'm not here for blessings Jesus, you don't know me Sorry, when I've just gone through the moon. 